Hello and welcome. Uh, welcome to the North Seattle College Art Gallery's Virtual Visiting Artist Lecture Series. Today I'm thrilled as we have the artist Lauren Ida um, talking with us. I'm Amanda Knowles, the curator of the NSC Art Gallery and printmaking and drawing instructor in the art department at North Seattle College. I'm pleased to work with Desiree Beadle, who is assisting in the gallery and will be doing things behind the scenes here today. NSC Art Gallery is nothing without the support from the college and from all of you for showing up to things. And so thank you, thank you for coming. I wanna tell you early on that we have live transcript available for those of you who want it. It can be turned on by clicking show subtitle at the bottom of your Zoom screen. For those of you who don't want it or find it distracting, you can turn it off by clicking hide subtitle. Use it if you wish, hide it if you wish, but we wanna be sure that we have it for those who need it. First, some acknowledgements. Uh, I will share my screen. And we start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, North Seattle College acknowledges that we occupy the lands of the Coast Salish peoples, the descendants of the first peoples of this region, a people whose cultures endure and are valued. <clears throat> Without this land and these cultures, we would not have access to this gathering, dialogue, and learning space. We take this moment to honor and thank the original caretakers of this land, their ancestors, and their descendants who are still here. We encourage participants here today to consider our responsibilities as we stand in solidarity with the sovereignty, cultural heritage, and lives of Native, Indigenous, and First Nations people. And then uh, also a labor acknowledgement. We also pause to recognize and acknowledge the labor that created the United States and from which we all benefit. We remember that our nation is built on the labor of enslaved people who were forcibly brought to the US from the African continent. And we recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. We acknowledge immigrant labor and recognize that voluntary forced and prison labor contribute to the building and ongoing maintenance of our nation. We acknowledge all unpaid caregiving labor. Additionally, we acknowledge the critical importance of the work towards racial equity that continues across this country in response to racial injustice and generations of structural racism against BIPOC communities. Um, and then this third slide shows what we're doing as we continue to work to go from acknowledgement to deed. We know that it is not enough to just acknowledge the land and labor and have to be sure that we are taking action. We show you here what actions North Seattle College and the NSC Art Department are taking to support BIPOC individuals and institutions and to be held accountable. We recommend Real Rent Duwamish and we will put that link in the chat for you to explore. Thank you. This is the last week of our current show in the NSC Art Gallery. Uh, it is an exhibition entitled Ideas of Home. It's a strong show of exceptional artists with diverse viewpoints on the matter of home. I hope that you will have a chance to stop by campus Parking enforcement is back, so when you come to campus, be sure to pay attention and pay for parking. I believe that the visitor parking lots along College Way um, are available, and, and there you can pay for shorter amounts of time. The right, light rail comes right to campus if the rest of that does not work for you. Uh, the gallery is open Monday through Thursday, 11 to 5 p.m., and Friday, 11 to 2 p.m. Uh, next week is Show Change, and the next show is by artist Janelle Abbott. It opens on Monday, March 13th, and on Monday, April 24th, 2003, Janelle will give a virtual visiting artist talk. We are also working on a closing for Janelle's show, an in-person closing. So please keep checking in with the gallery on Facebook, Instagram, and in our, on our website to find out what is going on in the gallery and who will be talking and when. We urge you to visit our website for links to recordings of all the talks to date, as well as the list of upcoming visiting artists. We will post our links in the chat. You can sign up for emails by contacting us at nscartgallery at seattlecolleges.edu. Thank you. Um, with this, it's finally time to introduce our visiting artist, Lauren <laughs> Keith. We are very lucky to have Lauren come to talk with us about her work. Lauren was born in Seattle and received her Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from Cornish College of the Arts. She shares her time between Seattle and Cambodia, exhibiting her work, creating public art installations and mentoring and representing uh, emerging contemporary Cambodian artists through Open Studio Cambodia. 
Lauren's work is represented by Art Exchange Gallery on First Avenue in Pioneer Square. She, she has shown her work extensively locally, nationally, and abroad. Lauren has been awarded an Artist uh, Trust Gap Grant, an Art Matters Foundation Fellowship, and a Denso Artist in Redis Residence uh, Award. Her work has been collected by the City of Bellevue Art Collection, Washington State Art Commission, Arts Commission, King County Public Art Collection, and the City of Seattle Portable Works Collection. She has been commissioned to create temporary and permanent public art by the City of Seattle, City of Shoreline, Washington State uh, Convention Center Edition, um, the Office of Arts and Culture, Seattle Department of Transportation, the City of Bellevue, Plymouth Housing, Sound Transit for the Redmond Station. Um, you know when that's opening? No. Never know. <laughs> Some years, yeah. Yeah, the Denver Theater District. And this year she's been commissioned to create a 38 and a half foot by three and a half foot hand cut paper and watercolor permanent installation for the new meta offices, which um, has is done. Um, Lauren is on the Washington State Arts Commission public art roster. This, the City of Seattle Ethnic Artists roster and the Sound Transit Artists roster. She is the founder of Open Studio Cambodia, um, an arts collective based in Siem Reap, Cambodia, which supports Cambodian contemporary artists and organizes exhibitions, art workshops, and contemporary art tours throughout the country. Much of Lauren's artwork is influenced by Cambodia, where she is been active since 2008 working on projects to support and mentor artists and other social and entrepreneurship projects. Other major influences include her family's Japanese American heritage and incarceration during World War II and celebrating her Northwest home. She uses art as a tool to raise money for care packages for a family who has been living through the war um, in Ukraine, the shelling, the cold Ukrainian win winter weather and in these cold and snowy days, she gives food and clothing to houseless folks in her local community and has worked to raise money to this end. I will hand you over to Lauren, but before I do, I wanna let the audience know that we'll be taking questions in the chat today. Lauren will not be following the chat, but if questions or comments arise during the talk, please write them in the chat and we will hopefully get to all of them. As usual, we will be sending a transcript of the chat to Lauren after the talk. So if you want to comment on the work and her words, please do, but, but you might be specific about what you're commenting on as she will see your words after the talk. Um, but I urge you to support her, her ideas and her work in the chat. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much um, for that introduction. Um, thanks to everybody who's here today. I'm hoping you can hear me okay. and. See me okay? Okay. Um, yeah, my name is Lauren Ida. I'm a Seattle-based public artist and my main medium is hand-cut paper. So as Amanda said, I am a Cornish College of the Arts graduate in 2014 and I'm born and raised in Seattle, but I've spent most of the last decade or more in Cambodia. Um, I developed my paper cut paper cutaway technique, which is just me cutting paper into positive and negative space with a exacto knife while I was studying video at Cornish. So I kind of did both while I was at Cornish, but I actually graduated with video art as my major. And I still make video as well. Um, but the paper cutting technique was really accessible to me and has become like my main medium that I really have most passion for and I'm really practicing most often. And these paper cut uh, pieces are often translated into durable substrates for public art. So this piece here on the left is a piece called Lemonade. And I just wanted to show some examples of how I use watercolor and sumi ink and blank white paper to create my compositions. This piece um, was recently hung in the judicial chambers of federal judge Tana Lin. And on the right side, you can see how I cut my ongoing temporary installation pieces is called the memory net. These are 30 or more feet long and they are cut from a single piece of paper that contain uh, trapped objects. Um, here we can see more of like the dimensionality of what I'm creating. So 
Sometimes I just cut one piece of paper and then paint on top of it. And sometimes I cut many pieces of paper and layer them to create one composition. So here's an example of multiple layers of paper. So the top layer is anything white in the piece. So her face, her hair, and then her shirt and sarong and shoes and the net are all the top layer cut from one single piece of white paper. And then I painted parts of it. Um, and then behind is the black layer. And then behind that is the background. Again, this piece, these are uh, portraits of Cambodian women who I met over my time living there. I speak the language now, so I'm able to really dive deep into uh, what people are experiencing, what people are doing. And it became different during COVID because I spent most of the early parts of the pandemic in Cambodia and watched how COVID hit Cambodia, which was different in many ways than how it affected other parts of the world. So this woman is disabled and in the last part of her life she's very ill uh, doesn't have enough money to receive medical care and she lives just with the mosquito net on top and then this curtain and it's she lives in kind of a three-walled outdoor wooden shack with corrugated metals so I made a portrait of her with her permission and then gave her back a copy um, so I often do that as well this piece was in my uh, September 2022 exhibition in Paris this piece also was part of that exhibition called Anticipation um, that I showed at Gallery Lee in, in Paris last year. And a lot of the pieces in that show were about scenes from my experience in Cambodia during the pandemic. So uh, this little girl is a friend, a friend of mine's daughter, and she ran into a hot soup pot and uh, burned her legs. So both of her legs are bandaged and I was with her every step of the way while she was healing, but there were issues because of COVID um, and her needed to go to the hospital. So in 2018, after I had lived on and off in Cambodia for about 10 years, I decided to put together my passion for art and my knowledge of fine art um, with Cambodian artists. And I started an, an art tour, a Cambodian contemporary art tour. So I used to guide groups of Seattle artists and art lovers, and then it became larger. And I started working with Atlas Obscura and taking guests from other parts of the country um, to Cambodia for two-week contemporary art tours. So we spent a lot of time with artists in their studios. We visited art schools. We visited arts-based um, nonprofit organizations and galleries. And we just had a really great time making art with Cambodian artists and really getting to know Cambodian artists on a deeper level and watching them work. And so that led me to meet a lot of Cambodian contemporary artists right away. And in my area, at the time I lived in the southern part of Cambodia in Kampot City, I ended up working with several artists who had a lot of skills and a lot of energy for art, but didn't have access to basic um, high quality art making materials like acid free paper or paint brushes or nicer acrylic paints or watercolors or things that would take their artwork to a professional level. And they also didn't have any space or money to store their work or frame their work. And a lot of them didn't speak English at all. So they were kind of unable to bridge the gap between uh, what they were doing at home and potentially selling in some of the fine art galleries in Cambodia. So I just started asking artist friends um, in Seattle for donated art materials. And then I allowed these artists to come to my house and work in my living room with me in my studio, in my rental house in Kampot. And then I offered them storage space um, for their finished art pieces and for their art making materials because most of them lived in like very bad housing. Like you can see in this picture that the man in the middle with the white shirt, that's his house. So he lives in a corrugated metal shack, which has no protection from water and mold and chickens and pests and all the things that would damage his artwork. So um, yeah, that's basically all I did at first. And then I started to invite people I knew who might be interested in purchasing Cambodian art to my house. And then I started to organize exhibitions in Kampot and then throughout Cambodia. And then now they've, uh, the Artists of Open Studio Cambodia have shown in uh, Paris, Singapore, Tokyo, Seattle, Denver, 
um, and other places around the world. So yeah, I'm really proud of them. And I still work with five contemporary Cambodian artists. Yeah, so this kind of reiterates what I just said, but I also mentored the artists. I, I taught them some skills, but very few actual technical skills because they were all practicing artists on their own, um, mostly self-taught before they started working with me. Um, on the left, you can see Moan Chia, who lost both of his arms in an electrical accident when he was uh, 20 years old. He's 31 now. He is the most prolific and most successful contemporary Cambodian artist that I work with. Um, he has had solo exhibitions and done paid public art in Denver. He yeah, wins awards and branched out from block printing into painting and other things as well. So really proud of him. Um, he just opened his own little shop and gallery in the Siem Reap Night Market in Cambodia too. And um, all of his art practice is done with donated or purchased materials from the United States or from outside Cambodia because mostly he works in block print and there are really very few um, block printers and very few block printing materials available in Cambodia. Um, so I'm always looking for volunteers to carry art supplies over and to carry artwork back if anybody's going to Cambodia. Uh, I also represent these artists by myself because I feel it's really important to have good ethical representation practices. And there are unfortunately a lot of people, mostly foreigners who come to Cambodia and exploit artists. There are very, very few, maybe one or two um, Cambodian owned art spaces in Cambodia. And so I have a, found a niche, niche for myself that's helpful because I speak Khmer and I can make available um, direct representation for a lot of artists who don't speak English at all. And then the next slide has several pieces from some of the other artists I work with. So uh, on the left, you can see Migration by Kim San. He's the elder who was in the white shirt in front of his own corrugated metal house. Uh, he and his mother fled to Thailand to the Khao Idang refugee camp, where many, many, many Cambodian Americans today either um, went through or lived in for up to many years, um, or are direct descendants of people who fled to Khao Idang or um, Site 2. There were two main large refugee camps near the border with Cambodia, but in Thailand, where people could run from the genocide of the 1970s, the Khmer Rouge genocide led by Pol Pot. So this piece is an oil painting uh, on canvas, and it's here in Seattle. This artist has uh disability and also some other issues and so for him specifically I needed to meet him where he's at um, with representation and so I just buy all of his artwork outright so every time he makes the painting I purchase it and right now I've been collecting them for about three four years and I would really like to put together an exhibition for him that is also educational for Cambodian Americans and for other people who are interested in learning about this experience. I do also sell prints for him of some of the pieces so that he can earn more money on a monthly basis. And then on the right side, you can see a piece called Liberation by Van Chavon. Van Chavon is 40 now. And when he was in his mid twenties, he was coerced and basically sold into um, forced labor into a slavery situation on a fishing vessel in the Gulf of Thailand. So this is a very, very common thing for Cambodian, Burmese, Vietnamese, Laotian, and also Thai um, men to be kind of exchanged between countries and um, forced to do fishing labor. Many, many, many of them die while they're at sea. And Van Chavon was very lucky to make it back to shore after two and a half years of being enslaved. And he was an artist before. His father was an artist as well before the Khmer Rouge genocide when he was killed. And he was able to study at um, Far Panlu Selpak Free Art School in Battambang, Cambodia. And he's a very prolific painter now and sculptor. So my house is full of these pieces, um, every time they finish pieces, I find ways for them to uh, get the pieces to me in Seattle. And then I try to organize exhibitions. So we had one in December at Ballard and Vestibule. 
And we are looking for another venue to have another exhibition this year with new open studio artwork. You can also look on our website and purchase directly from me on Instagram or the website. So I'm always looking for ways to use art as a tool for social change. I've always been an artist since I could hold a crayon and I've always been really passionate about helping people who are less fortunate than me. As Amanda said in the introduction, I'm also helping houseless people who live in my neighborhood now just by taking donated clothing, like winter clothing, any jackets, socks, pants, things like that, um, and donated food items and donations of money. And I just cook meals in my own kitchen and take all those clothes and pass them out to people who are cold uh, sitting on the streets nearby me. So I'm trying to figure out ways to incorporate art into that as well. I'm doing some video documentation of the lives of those people, but I'm also, yeah, always just kind of trying to highlight uh, issues that I see in our society or in history or in other countries um, with my art. And I think art is a really powerful tool to engage people and get people interested in learning about something they may not have already known about that might be actually right under their noses. So this piece here is called Hot to the Appearance of a Garment Factory Worker. This is from a series called 32 Aspects of Daily Life. Two times in my art career, I've recreated or reinterpreted two different series of traditional Japanese woodblock prints by an artist named Yoshitoshi, who was very prolific in the 1880s. He was considered to be like the last great woodblock, traditional woodblock printer or one of them. And uh, in 2017, I created 100 Aspects of the Moon, which was like after his series by the same name. So I created 100 individual paper cut pieces. And then uh, 2020, I created 32 Aspects of Daily Life, which were 32 portraits of women, of uh, Cambodian women or Cambodian female identifying people. This piece is a friend of mine. She's sort of an auntie. She's married to a an old friend of mine who's a tuk-tuk driver and she's sitting in the same posture and holding the red string in her mouth the same as the same posture of the original woodblock print from Japan that I was inspired by for this particular piece um, but she's dressed in her Cambodian like cotton pajamas basically floral and then on her card you, you can see 190 which is the minimum wage 190 US dollars is the minimum wage for um, garment factory workers in Cambodia currently, and they work uh, six days per week and more than eight hours a day. So they have no labor rights really, except for this, this new thing, which is their, their minimum wage, which most of them are paid. So uh, they are making clothes for all of the big brands that we see for sale in the United States. And I wanted to, to let people know that that was what they were paid. So this, this is uh, about the Citizens Indefinite Leave exhibition that I created and showed at Art Exchange Gallery um, in January and February 2022. This exhibition was made possible by a stipend I got for being appointed one of the artists in residence by Densho, the Japanese um, Legacy Project, which is based in Seattle. Uh, for many years, I have searched the Densho digital archives, which have just an incredible collection of photographs, video, letters, documents that uh, have to do with immigration from Japan pre-World War II and, um, and everything up until, you know, going into the concentration camps and then rebuilding their lives afterwards, um, after World War II. And so this is my my grandma, Clara, this is my paternal grandmother's older sister. Um, she passed away in August of 2022 at 103 years old. So I was really lucky to have the experience of being able to speak with her and have her show me firsthand her own photographs that she took before World War II when she was working at the World's Fair in San Francisco all the way through being incarcerated. She had photos of her friends who are in the camps, and then what happened after the war and how she and her family had to like try to make it on their own without um, having, having lost everything. Their family had lost everything that they built as immigrants for the previous 45 years. 
uh, before they were incarcerated for their Japanese ancestry during World War II. So this whole exhibition was 20 something new cut paper pieces that were all about um, my research into my own family's heritage and also into um, the Densho archives. And I was able to access through the help of um, the Densho archivists, like specific records of my family and specific like information and photos about specific topics that I was interested in. Uh, this piece on the left is my, um, my paternal grandmother, Mildred, and it's called Departed. And it has to do with the folktale of Urashima Taro, where a fisherman goes on a magical journey under the sea on the back of a sea turtle and has a great time under the sea in this magical wonderland. And when he comes back up, he realizes that 400 years have passed, but he thought it was only a couple of days. And so um, I was referencing the fact that when the Japanese Americans left camp, they were technically free, but their world was completely changed. They would never be seen the same way again. And everything they knew before they were incarcerated for their Japanese ancestry was totally different and mostly either gone or, or had changed to a hostile attitude about them for their race. So in the back of this piece, behind the waves, you can see the guard tower and castle rock from uh, the camp where my grandparents were incarcerated at Tule Lake, California. Yeah, here's another uh, piece from the same exhibition. So you can see how I use historical photos. Like this photo shows Japanese Americans and Japanese immigrants being rounded up and put into trains. They could only take what they could carry, what belongings they could carry. Um, they had to leave everything in a matter of a couple weeks. So property, businesses, vehicles, pets, friends, family. Um, they pulled people out of schools. They uh, took children of Japanese descent away from their white adoptive parents. Uh, they did all kinds of crazy things because of fear surrounding the bombing of Pearl Harbor. So here also, this is a photo from inside one of the camps at Manzanar. And this man is has all of his clothes hanging above him. And these barracks are very typical, like thin plywood walls, little cots that they had to fill their own mattresses with hay to sleep on, very crowded conditions, very unsanitary conditions, very cold in the winter, very hot in the summer. Um, and most Japanese people lived there for the duration of World War II. So this piece is called Nightmare. And I wanted to show the kind of uh, metaphorically the Japanese monster or like the that Japanese people were so vilified during this period in hi our history and how their Japanese-ness would always sort of haunt them like uh, a lot of the oral histories that I listened to from the Densho archives people who are incarcerated are talking about their Japanese faces and how from then on whenever they would look in the mirror and see their Japanese faces they felt ashamed or they felt worried that people would know they were Japanese and they felt afraid for the hostility that they had experienced during World War II. And so uh, I did a series of a couple pieces about um, nightmares use, using really traditional Japanese mythological like demons. And I really like to find in all of these um, very heavy and like, sinister photos in the Densho archives and other photos that I've come across. I like to find moments of resilience and try to highlight those as well. So these are two teenagers who are like in a band or learning to play in a band. Um, the Japanese inside the camps did a really good job of immediately and mostly on their own setting up schools and recreational programs and uh, temples and try to make the best of a really difficult situation and and keep community as a central focus for themselves. And so they, uh, my grandma Clara, she worked um, as in the rec center at the um, camp she was, they organized dances and music events and tried to create community inside the camps for young people. Okay, so I'm going to shift focus a little bit now. This is the memory net, which is my ongoing 
very large paper cut installation. It's not permanent, it's temporary. Um, it's meant to distract, it's meant to be destroyed. So I take this piece and kind of playfully set it places or install it places around the world, take photos of it. It takes on new meaning in each of the places where I put it and it takes on new meaning depending on what the objects are or how I've gathered the objects that I cut into to this piece. So this is a single piece of paper cut by hand. I've done this uh, yeah, in Seattle and Cambodia at the Burke Museum recently, um, kind of activating their collection of like what I chose was shoes from around the world um, as a symbol for being human. So they let me go into the archives, like the, the back where they keep all the collections and figure out which shoes I wanted to pull out and, and use as inspiration for my uh, memory net that I did inside the Burke Museum some months ago. So this piece is in Fremont and it's cut from a single piece of paper. And again, this is a different memory net and this is in a very small village where I used to live in Cambodia. And this also is in Cambodia in a different, totally different area in a sunken, we call, what we call the sunken forest in the Northwest of Cambodia. So these pieces contain objects from my, mostly these ones you've seen before from my personal experiences. So I've created kind of a language of objects, which I think is on the next slide. Oh, one more. Um, so there's reoccurring objects. Yeah, here we go. So you can see like a flower in front here. You can see flip-flops, glasses, a duck rabbit head, a cleaver, some different things that I repeat all the time. And other times I invite people to tell me or create their own memory, memory net language of objects. So here's some examples. Like these are just objects that I repeat in my work and meanings that I've assigned to these objects. So reading glasses for me are about pursuing education and holding oneself to a higher moral standard in the face of oppression. So that for me has to do with, I'm drawing parallels between um, houseless people, people, who, Japanese Americans who are incarcerated during World War II, Cambodians studying under the threat of death during the Khmer Rouge genocide, et cetera. And then some are much more personal like the silkworm and mulberry leaf. Um, because my my ancestors were kimono dyers, so they they raised silkworms and dyed kimonos. And this on the right side, this there's the severed duck head, and then there's one that's a rabbit or a duck. You don't know if it's a rabbit or a duck um, to symbolize like sometimes things are not as we seem, as we see them. Yeah. This piece I didn't plan to do when I arrived in Paris, but I um, walked outside the gallery that I was exhibiting in, this is last September, and noticed a little plaque on the wall that said that Christo and Jean-Claude had done their first ever piece together right at that spot, like two steps out my door of the gallery. So they, I don't know if I put it in the slideshow, but they built this huge wall of oil barrels and they filled up this whole street. It's a tiny street, but they filled up the entire street, like, I don't know, 15, 20 feet in the air with oil barrels to protest the Berlin Wall. And I decided to ask people who are coming into the gallery and ask people through my social media um, online, what objects reminded them of their pandemic experience. So I got like, uh, running shoes and house plants and music and lots of cooking and baking masks, different things that I hadn't cut it into a net before. And I cut this 30 foot long memory net and then I put it in the street and blocked the street in the same exact spot that Christo and Jean-Claude did in the eighties. Um, okay, so this is another way that I've used the memory net. This was called Memory Net to Home, and it was at Vestibule Gallery in Ballard in 2018. So this, before Vestibule was in, was in its current space, it used to be an Airbnb. This was just this tiny little space and had a bed at the top of the ladder there. 
So it was this really cool, comfy space and it was right in a residential area in Ballard. So I opened the doors of the studio and put a sign outside and said, come talk to me about the place you call home. This one was, tell me a symbolic object that reminds you of the place you call home. So whatever that means to you, what small object would you like to see in my art piece? And so over the course of 10 days, I had like more than a hundred people contribute in person and online. I cut all the objects in and then put this piece on the ceiling. And then I hadn't planned to do this at the beginning, but the idea kind of came to me while I was talking to people about the place they call home. I realized that um, the people that didn't have a home were people I had previously worked with um, through sanctuary arts. So I was an art teacher through Gage and sanctuary arts for homeless youth in before, uh, I don't know what year that was, 2016 maybe. Um, so I decided to see if they want to do a photo shoot with the memory net and told them all about the project and let them decide kind of how to pose themselves and how to use the paper installation in photos um, that a professional photographer took. This piece is, so this is a different memory net. This has color, it's watercolor, um, watercolor objects that are attached to the net. This piece I did for Densho last year, also for the 80th anniversary of Franklin Roosevelt's um, executive order that removed all people of Japanese descent from the West Coast during World War II. We asked the question, what object symbolizes hope, strength, and or resist resistance for you or your ancestors during World War II? in the Japanese American incarceration. And we put out a big call through Densho and a lot of people wrote in and sent photos of objects that their families had kept through all the decades or um, objects that had been lost that people remembered having um, that I recreated artistically in this uh, new piece. And this hangs in the Densho community room in like on Rainier or Yesler, but it's not open to the public currently. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about my permanent public art pieces um, in painted mural, tile, mosaic, cut metal, projection and sculpture. A lot of these are in fabrication still, but there are several that you can see now on the streets of Seattle, like in Lower Queen Anne, International District and coming soon to Redmond. And um, there's one in Federal Way still as well. There's a few that are in fabrication. This piece is in Denver. This was done in Denver. So they have this really cool project called the People's Projector. And it, um, from an adjacent building, like projects exactly onto the Fisher Clock Tower in downtown Denver. This is, I think Seattle should have this. It's so cool. Um, so they employ artists to make uh, videos that they project for like a month at a time. And so I was given this opportunity right near the outbreak of the war in Ukraine. And I started to correspond with a Ukrainian mother who I met through Airbnb, like making a donation through Airbnb. And we started becoming friends and we wrote emails back to, we write emails back to each other. Um, I had just become a mother for the first time at really very, very uh, short time before I met um, Olga is her name. And she has two children, Sophie and Arena, who are four and seven years old. And her husband went to fight on the front lines in Kharkiv. They lived really near the Russian border. And so her and her daughters had to flee their home and try to find, you know, a space to live in the countryside away from the bombing. And I was corresponding with her the whole time and trying to raise money for her through my artwork. So first I did like a time-lapse video of my hands uh, cutting and painting the art piece that you see on the right side here. And I sold a bunch of those and gave Olga all the money. Um, and then I, you'll see at the very end of this presentation, I did another piece um, that I had produced in silk screen by a friend of mine uh, at Cornish. That's like a cranes, paper cranes mandala with the Ukrainian flag colors. And so in the last almost year, I've raised something like uh, 3000 or $3,500 for Olga and her family. So she was able to buy a generator that they need to have power and heat through the Ukrainian winter, winter where they live now. 
and I've sent them two care packages of clothes and art supplies and like um, little toys and stuff like that to keep them entertained um, with donated money. And mostly I've just given the cash to them. This piece is in fabrication now through the Titan Mosaic um, place in Titan, Washington. It's so cool if you haven't checked it out. This is uh, for Redmond Sound Transit. And it's based on a piece I created for my Citizens Indefinite Leave um, exhibition called Rock, Paper, Scissors, which is based on this historical photo from inside one of the Japanese internment camps on the right side. So this is the first time that my work has been created in tile mosaic. I'm really excited about it because it's a whole new, new realm for me. And I believe this is still up. Uh, it should be still up, but I'm not exactly sure. Um, this was a temporary mural for created for Sound Transit Federal Way in 2019. It's 120 feet long and it contains memory net and memory net objects. And from my own experience, my family's experience as immigrants and prisoners. And also I put out a call for other people to contribute objects that uh, were, were symbolic of their refugee and immigrant experience to the United States. So you can see in the middle there or towards the right side, there's my um, grandma Clara with her prisoner ID number from inside camp. Um, and another family portrait on the left side of all the siblings in 1939, just before the war broke out. So shortly after I installed this or Sound Transit installed this piece, um, somebody vandalized it with the knife and also other murals around my mural that were also created for the same project. And all of us were people of color. All of, it was, it was, um, Advertise this project was marketed and presented as uh, like people of color sharing their stories for this mural project at Federal Way. And so because somebody kept coming by and slashing all of our murals um, with knives over and over again, uh, Sound Transit finally declared it an act of um, racism, like racially charged hate crime, basically. So they told me that I could just have my work reprinted or taken down, but I decided to repair the panels. So I actually took the, the ripped panel, the cut panels, and then I used the idea of kintsugi, golden joinery, which is an ancient art from Japan of repairing broken pottery with precious metals like gold. Um, and I decided to sew with wire, with golden wire, the cut spaces and then paint with uh, gold paint over. And then I reinstalled several panels with a statement. So I'm gonna read the statement quickly. If you look closely at this mural, you will see it has been slashed in an act of racist vandalism once shortly after its installation in August, 2020 and again in late 2021. The damage speaks to the political situation in America where we are so divided that some feel the only way they can be whole is by destroying the work of others. The artist Lauren Ida has repaired it using her interpretation of kintsugi or golden joinery, the Japanese art of repairing broken pottery by mending severed areas with precious metals such as gold. As a philosophy, it treats breakage and repair as part of the history of an object rather than something to disguise. So this piece is not open to the public and it's it's not public art, but it is a large installation. And I wanted to put it in this presentation because it's the largest piece I've ever made and installed um, as hand cut paper. And it also is unique because it has uh, ink and watercolor across the entire piece. I wrote wrong in the introduction that you gave Amanda. It's actually eight and a half feet tall and it's 38 and a half feet wide. Um, so it is, it was commissioned by Meta, Facebook, and it's in their offices in Bellevue. So the offices in Bellevue where Meta's now has their headquarters used to be Japanese farmland before World War II. And so um, I wanted to highlight that history by um, using again, photos and information from the Dencho uh, digital archive to, to create like this agricultural themed uh, Japanese American history piece. 
And you can see here that I also incorporated the idea of the golden thread again. And this is just painted paper that I wove all the way from one end to the other end through the people and the plants. This piece you can see now, um, this is right across the street from the Seattle Rep in the Plymouth Housing Building that now is also the home of Path with Art. So if you just walk around the back side of the building, there's a courtyard that a bunch of businesses share. Uh, there's also a signal box of mine right across the street in front of McMinimins as well, across Roy. So that's like two pieces you can see in one little tiny area if you want. Uh, this piece was created for Plymouth Housing, which is transitional housing uh, for formerly houseless people and or low income housing for formerly ho houseless people. It's 130 feet long and it was painted by uh, volunteers and artists from Urban Artworks, but designed by me in cut paper. So this was pretty cool that all these volunteers um, came out and painted panels. They have this special kind of uh, printed, digitally printed paper that has a template, a ghost template printed on it. So anyone can help fill in the blanks and fill in the, the paint. Yeah, here's another picture of the side. So the paper cranes um, in Japanese culture symbolize resilience in difficult times and peace and hope. So uh, I wanted to give them a really like, powerful, hopeful, colorful mural for the the low-income housing space. This is the other side of it. It's another piece that I'm working with Urban Artworks on for a nonprofit organization that focuses on jazz education for children in the Rainier, will be hopefully in the Rainier neighborhood in the near future. Um, this mural uh, will wrap around the entire building, which is also low-income housing on the top and new home of Jazz Ed nonprofit on the bottom part. So for this, I used photos of, I referenced photos of actual students from their program and also um, historical photos and information about the uh, jazz history in that specific area, which was really interesting to learn about. So you can kind of see like clear examples of how I use people, how I make people's portraits from photographs. So I used a lot of images from uh, Mohai and like from the, there used to be a bunch of jazz clubs down there called the, like the black and tan. And um, it seemed like a very cool, vibrant jazz scene and a lot of famous jazz artists played there too. This piece was just installed. This is the new garage door for the Seattle Convention Center that used to be called the Washington State uh, Convention Center Edition, but it's the new gigantic building downtown. Uh, my piece is on Olive and Terry, but it is the garage door. So whenever the building is open and actually more than when the building is open, this piece is invisible because the door has to go up into the, like has to open to let cars in and out. So it's really only closed between midnight and 3 a.m. or something like that. Yeah, but this piece is, uh, this piece was created quite a few years ago way before COVID. And it has my grandmother's hands here on the left holding a flower uh, from a photo in camp, inside camp. And then it has all these um, flora and fauna and foods that are enjoyed by people in Japan and also people in the Pacific Northwest. So these, one of the main things that stayed after the trauma of uh, the incarceration for my family was the food. Like we don't, I don't speak Japanese. I was never taught Japanese. I was never uh, really informed about the incarceration history or much about my Japanese heritage as a child. But one thing that did trickle down was food and food traditions. So I wanted to honor that with this piece. Here's a close up of the original um, cut paper piece. 
So the white is paper and the black is negative space. This is about 22 feet wide. Okay, so to wrap up, um, basically I have focused my art career on using art as a tool for social change and trying to find intersections between art and social change. So I'm trying to encourage also other people to look at art as a powerful tool and to use their art practice to think of ways that they can improve their community or whatever issue they're passionate about. And I'm really excited to be back in Seattle permanently. I've been here for one year already, I think. Yeah, one year already. And I'm uh, going to stay here in Seattle. So I'm really having a great time, like getting to know more people in the art scene here and just more people in general and kind of moving forward in different directions than I have been with um, Cambodia for so many years while still doing, still maintaining Open Studio Cambodia. Um, this is the piece I was talking about before. This piece is for sale. It's $100. It's an original limited edition um, silk screen and it's, uh, all the proceeds go directly to Olga and her daughters. Um, I still have about maybe 15 or 20 of them left. And you can see all my work at laurenita.com through my Instagram, Laurenita Studio. I also have Facebook, uh, but Instagram is better. And um, Art Exchange Gallery on First Avenue downtown is, they always have an ongoing collection of my work. So yeah. Thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions, if we have time, yeah. If you have any questions, I can take some questions. Thank you so much. I'm gonna stop sharing if that's okay. Um, there were some questions that came up in the chat. Laura asked, I'm curious about what drew you to Cambodia and Cam Cambodian art to begin with. Okay, well, I was working as a nanny in Australia in 2008. I was 22 years old and somebody said, you should go to Cambodia on your way home. It's like our Mexico or whatever. So I was like, okay, I'll go on holiday. And I planned a two week trip to, uh, sorry, they told me I should go to Thailand, my friends in Australia. So I planned a trip to Thailand. Um, as soon as I was about to get on the plane, there were all these protests in Bangkok and the, the protesters shut down the airport. And so then I was able to choose where I would like to go other than Bangkok. And I had a friend of a friend who lived in Cambodia who said, oh, come here. It's awesome also. And you can go to Thailand later from here so easily. I was like, okay. So I arrived in Cambodia and I didn't know anything about Cambodia at all. I'd never heard of the Khmer Rouge. I'd never heard of Pol Pot. I'd never heard of the genocide. I didn't know one thing about Angkor Wat or Cambodian culture or history or food or anything. And I remember getting off the airplane and just feeling like the heat and the smells and the, the chaos and the people and um, zooming through traffic on, a, on the back of a motorcycle and was really, really blown away. And I had traveled a lot before that around the world, but Cambodia just has um, something special for me, some kind of special draw for me. And um, at this point, I feel like I've been there for so long. I have really deep roots in the community and I have so many um, friendships and experiences that I don't feel like it's traveling anymore. I really feel like it's a second home for me. And Cambodian art is really fascinating for me because pretty much all the creative people were either fled the country because they had to or were or were perished, were murdered specifically for being artists or creatives, musicians, religious leaders, um, kind of anyone who was thinking for themselves or thinking outside the box was uh, a target for, for like execution. So that means that there's very few elder Cambodian artists, but Cambodia and Cambodian culture, like from what we know from the ancient temples of Angkor Wat, is like for thousands of years, Cambodia has, uh, the Khmer people have been extremely artistically talented and architecturally talented and creatively talented people that hold those things very dear. And so it's really, really interesting to see how this younger generation is like flourishing in the arts and sort of 
inventing themselves as an artistic place without like a lot of teachers or elders who are who are able to guide them they're really um the Cambodian art scene right now is really really exciting that's why I loved um guiding my tour because I really I also would find new artists popping up everywhere all the time and nobody was kind of following like a designated path like I feel like a lot of other cultures do like in fine art so yeah there's a lot of really exciting things going on in Cambodia in contemporary fine art and music and uh, traditional music and contemporary music performing arts circus there's yeah a lot of really cool things going on great thank you there was also a question about the question is how do you get clothes and other resources how do we get things to you Okay, so it's just me, and I also have a baby, and uh, you know, very busy schedule. So if you want to donate clothes to me, you can uh, send me a message on Instagram or an email or a Facebook message. Usually, Instagram is the best, but email is okay too. And then I will tell you when I'm going to be sort of nearby, or when one of my other friends and partners in this uh, endeavor will be nearby. So like I know on Thursday, I'll be in downtown Seattle for sure. And sort of south of downtown Seattle, like in the Rainier Yesler area. Sunday, I'll be in the International District. So yeah, I can tell you sort of like approximately when I'll be somewhere and we can meet in a public place and you can uh, give me bags of clothes. I'm looking for anything that might be useful to somebody living on the street. Shoes, socks, anything warm is great, but Things that are not warm are fine too, because I'll just keep them in my garage and give them to people later. <laughs> yeah, food, potatoes, like anything that's not immediately perishable. Yeah, coffee maker, need a coffee maker and some coffee. Great, thank you. The question is, how do you see the history of Cambodia influencing the art of your students? Um, the artists that I work with vary in like how they, incorporate or don't incorporate traditional elements like Van Chavon, the painter who I showed you um, the sort of Buddha looking or religious looking figure with the yellow background who was enslaved on the um, fishing vessel in the Gulf of Thailand. He uses more traditional um, imagery like what, what they call kabaik, K-B-A-C-H, which is a very, very old traditional ornamental style of, um, it's on architecture, it's in drawings and paintings from Angkor Wat in Cambodia. And he uses some religious symbolism, but then like Moan Chia, the block printer who works mostly in black and white and, um, you know, focuses more on like real contemporary stories, like real stories of his real life. His work, I wouldn't say has much to do with Cambodian traditional art at all. So that's another thing that I'm really trying. I think a lot of people who work with Cambodian creatives are trying to convey, even people who work in tourism or even Cambodians. There is this very tragic history of uh, Khmer Rouge genocide, or civil war. Um, there's still a lot of poverty. There are a lot of major social issues that have happened and still are happening in Cambodia. Um, but there's also a very, very rich um, history of arts, culture, music, architecture. And there's also a new generation of contemporary artists who are moving forward even more than, than any of that, departing more than that as well. So I think sometimes when people think um, like about Cambodian art, they're naturally tend they naturally tend to think about like traditional elements but there's a whole other like sector of contemporary artists that are like competitive in an international art scene as well yeah <laughs> you want to ask your question live sure hi lauren it's really nice to see your face and see your work so exciting i think i got to see your piece up before it got slashed um, I just happened to be like pulled over because I was trying to take a phone call and I was right in front of it. It was very, oh, cool. <laughs> very uh, I was just curious about your use of like black and white and color together. And if that's sort of a, a reference to like bringing like historical elements into contemporary 
events or if it's something different? Yeah, I'll, um, yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So I've been playing around with that a lot over the last couple of years. And like you can see in the piece where the two um, young people are playing the drums inside camp. And also the first piece I showed you, Lemonade, where the woman is kind of like in a halo of, of grade tone and then it goes out to these like vibrant lemons. That is exactly what I was trying to go for is that kind of making it clear that these are historical photos and that I don't want to invent colors that may not have been there, but also that we can like bring new attention and new life and new vibrancy and by honoring these, these moments and people and portraits and like making new art about it. That's colorful. So yeah, that's, that was my intention. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. There's a question, it's kind of a general question and I'm, I wonder if it needs a little bit of um, more to it, but is there a specific social cause that you have the most um, satisfaction with helping with your art or is it is your, this is how I'm sort of, I'm gonna kind of clarify that a little bit. Like, is it that you feel as though you should be doing something to help no matter what? Yeah. Um, well, I have a couple of thoughts on that. M mostly I do, mostly I help people who are less, I mean, I always help people who are less fortunate than me or want to highlight social issues because I look around and I, I get bothered by what I see. I am bothered by it. And um, I don't know why uh, some other people don't get bothered as much by me as uh, as I do about these things but I mean I moved recently to a different area of, this, of Seattle and I went to the grocery store and every single day I'm walking past people who have one leg and they're they have no socks on and it's snowing and you know they're like cold they have no teeth they have no clothes on like I think there's a lot of discrimination against houseless people and I think that at the end of the day, like everybody deserves to wear a jacket if it's snowing and everybody deserves to wear socks if it's snowing and everybody deserves to eat nutritious food or like to have food or to have access to water or a toilet. And um, it's pretty shocking for me to come from Cambodia, which has a lot of very visible poverty and a huge um, disparity between rich and poor. And is considered to be like a pretty poor country. And then I come to the United States again and I see like all these people sitting on the street, like on the ground in the snow and they don't have food or any way to get a house or do it. You know, they're uh, living in abject poverty as well. And I think there's, anyway, that's part of my rant about that. But it's really hard for me to walk past somebody who is really suffering, like clearly suffering, like visibly suffering and not do something about it. And I have just discovered that that art can be a really powerful tool as a as kind of a um, connector of all my passions or connector of like all the problems I see. And I'm an artist, so I want to like collect all that and like keep putting it into the same equation sort of like I have I see a problem or I know about a problem or I, I know about a historical problem or I research about a new problem and then I want to make art about it and I want the art to capture the attention and the the passion or the mind of people who look at the art and then I want them to take action to help me help them or to just like go out into your own community and make some cookies and give them to a homeless guy you see in front of the grocery store and have a conversation, you know, ask what his name is. Like, you know, people just want to talk. The other day, this guy, I was like, what do you want from the grocery store? And he was like, well, I really love to learn and read. I don't really have anything to read. <laughs> so I bought him a National Geographic, <laughs> you know, so it's not always like, um, I think if you talk to people and just uh, have mm, try to have less fear and more compassion then even if you're not an artist or not using art directly like you can make a difference in somebody's day just by making eye contact shaking their hand and talking to them um, but art is such a powerful tool so when I make art and I sell it 
in a gallery, like it's great. But when I make art and I sell it to raise money for a Ukrainian family, or um, when I when I just work with artists in Cambodia and then sell their art and they are employed and they have money to build houses and get married and have children and not live on the streets themselves, like that also makes me feel really good. So I know that helping people is, uh, I know that helping people makes me feel good too. And I don't think there's anything shameful about that because some people are like oh I shouldn't get any satisfaction out of it if I you know am doing it selflessly but um why not because doing something is better than doing nothing you know that's what I always tell myself so yeah and I think other I hope I inspire other artists who might have like skills or ideas or supplies or ambitions or who are passionate about any kind of social issue to like think about creative ways that they can put themselves into action in an artistic way. Nobody's asking anyone, you know, you don't even have to go that far out of your comfort zone to like refocus what you're making or what you want to make or what you're doing like into um, something that's really helpful for other people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I want to be conscious of time. I know we have a couple other questions. Um, do, how are you feeling? Do you want to? Yeah, go ahead. I'm good. I'm good to like 1.30 probably. Okay. Yeah. Um, Joan is interested in how your consciousness and knowledge of history was raised when you got uh, to Cambodia at the age of 22. How did I learn about like the history and um, from the people? Yeah. I used to be really shy <laughs> as a kid and, and uh, I, don't, I don't know why, but I sort of came out of my shell like around 18. And then by 22, I was like walking up to all the tuk-tuk drivers, you know, hi, how's it going? What are you doing? And I just sit in people's tuk-tuks. I would go, you know, pull up a stool in the, in the local markets, like talk to the lady. Nobody spoke English at that time. And I didn't speak Khmer at that time. But that's how I learned. I had a little notepad and then I would like, you know, hold, there was this woman who sold secondhand clothes in a big pile at the market. So I would hold the shirt up and be like, you know, t tell me the word for this in Khmer. And she would, it would, eventually I learned like a lot of words from her, like about clothes, about weather, about food, about colors, about numbers, prices, money, whatever. And then just kept like step-by-step step being my way, you know, to get to know more people through just like spending time and yeah I was broke <laughs> for sure <laughs> it was fun yeah um so I would say that the his a lot of the historical knowledge I have about the uh genocide era and before the genocide and after the genocide and during the civil war is like firsthand experiences from people I know spending a lot of time with um any elders that I can find, but also people who are my age or younger. And uh, speaking the language anywhere you go is like really helpful, of course, because you get all those cultural nuances that you can't get on if you're having a translator and living with Cambodian people. You know, I lived with a lot of my, of a lot of the artists that I work with over the years um, with my adopted son, like in the village and yeah, uh, I don't know a lot about Angkor Wat history, and I don't know a lot about political history, and I don't know, you know, a lot about, like, uh, natural resources and stuff, because that's not my interest, necessarily. My interest is really about um, people and culture. I worked with an indigenous group called the Punong people in Cambodia, too, B-U-N-O-N-G, transcribing and illustrating a children's book for them that um, was an incredible experience. Uh, so there's like a million ways that people can use art to affect social change or positively influence like an issue that they're um, passionate about. And I've just tried to like trial and error my way through that. And I have fallen on my face many times. Like failure is a huge part of this <laughs> for sure. But at 38, I'm, you know, yeah. I'm happy with what, what I've done and I'm happy with where I'm at. I'm proud of myself. And I know that I've made a big impact using my best tool, which is art. That's wonderful. Um, I, uh, I have been in situations to, to 
try to talk to people about things, then there has to be a lot of trust um, when yes. things go that deep. And so I know that the taking of the time is really important to that process. Yeah, for sure. So um, thank you. Thank you for your time here. Thank you for what you do. Um, just in general, your, your beautiful yeah. heart. <laughs> Um, helping people and um, yeah I hope that all the people here can um, maybe give what they can to help your endeavors yeah. if you buy Cambodian open studio Cambodia art that helps the Cambodians if you buy the Ukrainian uh, prints that helps the Ukrainian family if you buy a pair of socks <laughs> that helps the houses people I'm thinking about like, yeah, I have all kinds of ideas. If you knit, knit them a scarf, you know, if you sew, sew them a blanket. If you have a dog, share some dog food. There's so many things that people need and, and they don't have, it doesn't have to be through me. Like I encourage people to cook a meal or bake some cookies and walk outside and see who you find because there's a lot of people living on the streets and it's cold out there. Hand warmers, hand warmers are good. Socks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you.